Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Pond, awards editor of The Wrap, and we're happy to have you here for our awards screening of Cyrano with director Joe Wright and cinematographer Seamus McGarty. We're going to show you the trailer to the film, and then we'll go right into a conversation with our guests. Uh, to the audience, please participate in the live chat, share your thoughts about the film, and let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, before I introduce Joe and Seamus, let's take a look at the trailer to Cyrano. Hey, Steve. Cyrano? Cyrano. Cyrano. Pleasure to meet you, Cyrano de Bergerac. You're a freak. Freak. Best friend, I'd be very angry with you if you died. My sole purpose on this earth is to love Roxanne. Does she know? The world will never accept someone like me and a tall, beautiful woman. We have no money. A clever marriage is your only option. I won't be rescued. I'm not in distress. Love, does that mean nothing to you? Children need love. Adults need money. I need something to die for. Write poems and cry for, and I won't be ashamed. I'd give anything for someone to say that they can't live without me and they'll be there forever. I have a confession to make. I am madly in love. Perhaps he feels the same. But I've never actually spoken to him. Of your love? Of anything. <laughs> He is Christian, Christian Nubilet. He's a new recruit in your regiment. Of course he is. A woman like Roxanne wants wit, romance, poetry. I don't know how to speak romantically. I am a poet. My words upon your lips. I will make you romantic. Will you make me handsome? She loves me! I give anything for someone to say. All the words I know. like you do in your letters. You are a beautiful flower. I am not a flower. I need more. You're in love with her. My fate is to love her from afar. We must let her decide our fate. She must have the choice. Welcome back. It's my pleasure to introduce director Joe Wright and cinematographer Seamus McGarvey. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I have I, I have to say I I'm um, I've been I've had a particularly fondness for for Sarah Nutter Bergerac since I since I appeared in a high school production of it many many years ago. Um, and, but I think what's what's interesting is how fresh Cyrano can seem when you take the nose out of the equation. Uh, absolutely. I think the, the, the idea of that central piece of casting was pivotal, really, in our desire to, to make the film. Um, uh, and we wanted to create quite a kind of modern take on, on the material. Um, we wanted to create something that was uh, deeply emotional and intimate uh, but also with a kind of modernity that meant we weren't you know um, constricting ourselves to a specific time or place the film is really a um, a fantasy of a period rather than a period movie right now you you were first exposed to it because your your partner Haley Bennett was in was in a production I guess the original production with with Peter Dinklage of of the stage musical right I mean what what made you think that 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 there was a movie in it um, well I've always I've always loved the story and uh, I remember you know I think I was about eighteen when I saw the Gerard Depardieu version and uh, and I loved I loved that. Um, uh, I identified with Cyrano, it felt like he was speaking on my behalf as a kind of angst-ridden teenager. Um, but I did feel like it had been done before, albeit in, in French. Um, 
And <clears throat> when Haley invited me to this tiny workshop production up in Chester, Connecticut, um, and it was a very spared down production, but really the the casting of Pete um, uh, and playing Cyrano without the nose suddenly um, felt uh, incredibly immediate. It had an authenticity and a kind of um, uh, a power that I hadn't foreseen. And and I and I and I felt that there was something here that one could build upon. I mean, I think often the creative success of a movie is about the right actor in the right role at the right time, um, and and it felt like such a moment. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Seamus, had you seen the the stage production? No, no, I hadn't. Uh, Joe described it to me, but I I didn't actually get a chance to see uh, Mr. Dinklage and and Miss Bennett in in the roles. At the time, but you know, when when it came to us talking about the film, Joe and I talking about the film, we just had the screenplay, Erica's screenplay, and and that was our springboard to to think of it in cinematographic terms from the outset. Right. Joe was aware of the play before, obviously. Yeah. So, what were your early conversations like? I mean, what was the idea visually for for the film? Well, there's, there's a really exciting thing that happens with working on a film with Joe Wright is that he he kind of we go into a room uh, and and seal ourselves off for a couple of weeks, literally, and and sort of imagine the film. It's it's a really exciting time when you can go through the screenplay scene by scene and and think up the shards of photography that will make up the final movie. And, you know, usually, you know, looking back on Joe's earlier storyboards, stick insect storyboards from earlier films, they usually end up looking pretty much like the final movie. He's very assiduous about, about the grammar of, of cinema and photography and what a shot means. So that's the really exciting stuff. It's all in the preparation, you know, when you're, when you're working out how you're going to shoot it. Mm -hmm. Right. I think also that the, the we, you know, the past two or three films ever since Anna Karenina really have been quite presentational in style. Um, I use that word as opposed to theatrical because I've got a problem with theatrical, but um, uh, they've, you know, they've been wider lenses and they've been quite kind of um, presentational. Whereas with this, because of the the musical form, it felt we had to work against that theatricality, inherent theatricality, and uh, we tried to develop something that was probably more observational, uh, um, maybe a bit more like uh, some of our earlier work. So we were using longer lenses and we were using, um, you know, we were, we were allowing the, the performers to move uh, more naturally um, and we were we were kind of playing with those ideas rather than something that was, as I say, quite so theatrical. Right. So did you have did you have a firm idea of of what you wanted it to look like when, you know, after after seeing the, the stage play and starting to think about the film? Yeah, I, I did. I mean, I kind of felt like I could see and hear and feel the rhythms in my uh, bones and it was something that was possibly a little bit reminiscent of the puppet theater that I came that I came from that I come from. Um, uh, it was something kind of um, something quite romantic at the beginning that becomes more and more minimalistic towards the towards the end. Um, I always start with kind of tentpole moments that I know, okay, I've got that moment and I've got that moment and I've got that moment. And then what I'm doing is I'm building between those moments um, that I know I want to have realized um, that I have to see on the on the screen that, that, that are playing in my head. Mm -hmm. Right. So for for both of you on this one, I mean, what were the what were the, the tentpole moments that you that you knew from the start? Well, certainly, uh, spoiler alert but the moment christian gets shot um that i i always i had that in my head from quite an early point 
um, specifically because it was something that couldn't be done in the theater. Um, and I knew that I wanted to make a movie of this moment because there was something that, that couldn't be done in the theater. Um, uh, also the, the, the whole theater sequence uh, at the beginning of the movie, um, I had this kind of depiction of a society in my mind um, that I was really excited about. Um, I also had this idea of the of, of, of the song Every Letter and this idea that it would be a kind of menage a trois between three people who are never in the same room um, and, and something to, to get across the kind of um, the sexiness of words, really. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, those were three of the ten part moments. And then you build more, you know, as you go as you go along, you, you kind of find the connections as it were yeah yeah Seamus were there moments in, in the film that you were looking at thinking all right that's going to be a real challenge <laughs> you were I mean making a film is a challenge in, in in every every time you make a film there are different challenges this one presented a, some very big challenges to us firstly making a film during pandemic uh, in Sicily uh, during lockdown, but in a paradoxical way, the, those sort of uh, corrals became a great help to us. They they allowed us to create a, a, a real profundity of focus. Actually, in in our little troop of filmmakers, we had Sicily to ourselves, not to to ourselves. We were able to to work without distraction of tourists or of restaurants or bars um it was it was really uh interesting to to have the run of a city like nato a beautiful baroque city and and it, it to feel like a, a back lot uh, and so that was good obviously the, the challenges of shooting in a volcano on a volcano like mount etna at, at altitude in the snow minus 20 has certain constraints and we had a, an amazing group of people our crew were just heroic in 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 kind of acting like soldiers themselves to to make our film work uh, and and we all felt a, a, a great sense of camaraderie uh, working together it felt like we were a centipede in overtime, but uh, it, w making our film together. It was when we when we finally wrapped as the volcano erupted behind us. Um, <laughs> there was a sense of great achievement. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, Joe, you were making this movie basically during the thick of of the pandemic in a country that had been hit pretty hard by it. I mean, was it important to to do it then and not and not wait? Yeah, very much so. It felt like an act of defiance in the face of these terribly bleak circumstances that the world was was facing to make something beautiful um, and and about human connection and how important it is to connect with our fellows. Um, and 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 we took that. I mean, you know, and also there were people who needed to work as well. You know, there were people who needed to put food on the table. The British government was very, very late in um, uh, giving any help to the you know freelance arts uh, community, and so uh, and so we needed to get food on the table as well. Um, so there was that kind of practical concern, and then there was a sort of um, a philosophical or emotional response to the pandemic um uh one of kind of one of wanting to 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 make a film that in itself was about a love of life um and um uh, as all my, hopefully my films are you know but 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 so we went out there and and we gathered an amazing group of um including supporting artists about 300 people from all parts of um, the world uh, and we created this bubble and and we we set about making this thing that was incredibly tender and passionate and uh, and and in defiance as I say there was this kind of um, energy about making the film that was that was 
extraordinary, unlike anything I've ever experienced, really. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I here I think I heard this from from you last time we we talked that Glenn Hansard was was out busking on the street for beer money in the little town in Sicily that you were working in. Absolutely, yeah. Glenn and and the guys who played the guards uh, in the cave uh, became very close, and um, and they started busking before the town uh, then got shut down with the second or third wave that was coming through. Um, but yeah, they. I mean, I kind of I try and create a company atmosphere amongst um, uh, my collaborators. Um, and and you know we 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 eat together and we we cry together and we sing together um, uh, and that's an important aspect of making the movies you know uh, we spend our lives doing this so we might as well enjoy it um, I, the process of making the film is as important to me as the as the product. Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking of, of singing together, I mean, I I feel like every musical has that that thing that they have to face which is you know sort of the moment when an actor on screen stops talking and starts singing and how do you navigate that moment and how do you sell it to the audience and and you know i mean you have that moment very early on when when haley is in the the cab with the geish and, and she you know she's talking and then it just sort of shifts into into song but um you know how how tricky is that to navigate that that transition i mean i thought about each transition very carefully and had a specific audio plan um of how to shift from one to the other um but it was very important to me that all the cast are singing live on camera um so there was a kind of naturalism to the performances and the, the performances were sometimes broken um but the, the the humanity would come through the cracks if you like um and it was trying to create this atmosphere where it's as natural as singing along to the radio whilst you do the washing up you know um in one moment we're talking and then in the next moment you you take a breath and you start to give your speech a melody and a rhythm um uh and generally that's what we were aiming to do i mean some of the songs have a have a slightly more declamatory style like Haley's um i need more which is a big kind of power song you know um and a lot of fun for it um uh but but often the songs are just um our emotions sang and it's quite simple and not to try and overcomplicate it you know and get bogged down in it uh, i was i'm always looking for simplicity or the more the, the more movies i make the more i'm looking for simplicity yeah um i mean seamus when the film shifts from you know from dialogue to the song does that change what you're doing does that change your your approach well not really actually it, chiming in with what joe's is, is saying just to reiterate that sense of natural flow that that somehow the thoughts become sung rather than spoken and and i think that we decided not to go for you know the declamatory style for most of the songs in in the film you know I, I've, I've worked on musicals before that are big song and dance numbers like you know greatest showman for instance we we have a couple of beyonce type moments in, in this in this film but um i think what we were aiming for more was about that sense of of quiet portraiture in the song and and looking at the actor emoting their their thoughts through this these wonderful tunes that the national have have uh, made um so our large format uh, camera and lenses allowed for a, a kind of more of a medium format portrait photography moment of 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 silent almost whispered song for some of the most powerful moments i think in the in the film 
so we weren't aiming for something that was uh, kinetic at that at, at those points. They were really about the actor relaying their innermost thoughts. Yeah. Um, you, you also have the wonderful moments where, you know, in, in a couple of places in, in Ragano's Bakery or, or with the cadets where people working suddenly shifts subtly into, into dance. And, and, you know, you're working with the, the brilliant choreographer, Sidi Larby Trakawi. Um, and I found those, those moments so powerful when, you know, when daily chores turn into, turn into dance. Um, I mean, Joe, what was, um, I think, I, think they, I, I love your, your, your idea that they turn subtly into dance because that was exactly what we were trying to achieve. Um, uh, Sidi Labi and I had first worked together on Anna Karenina, which I kind of conceived as a, as a sort of ballet, really, um, a ballet with words. And then we worked together in the theater, um, uh, most uh, importantly for us with, with um, Chiwetel Ejiofore on a, on a show about Patrice Lumumba. And then we uh, re-teamed on this. And Labi's choreography is fascinating to me um, because there's a very, as you say, there's a very fine line between blocking or how we move in our everyday lives and dance. And he kind of doesn't, he 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 refuses to accept that division. Um, so 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 the dance is just the natural expression of our uh, normal physical um, or heightened expression of our normal physical actions that portray convey our emotions, our feelings, and our relations specifically to each other. Um, uh, so. For instance, um, uh, Haley in the in the in the every letter song when she's on the bed, you know she's sitting on the bed and then she turns and lies down on the bed. Um, uh, so he takes that action and turns it into a choreography. Um, but it's not is it dance or is it just her shifting her position? You know, um, and I really love those those subtleties and those kind of questions around movement and how we express ourselves physically. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I mean, I, I would think Seamus, those moments give you um, sort of license to to be a little more dramatic. At I mean, I I think of the overhead shot of the the cadets dancing from way above the the. Thing. I mean, you know. There is a there is a different approach sometimes when we get fully into those. I would well, think. exactly. I think that the kineticism that you sort of feel sometimes in the movie is not created through camera movement necessarily. I think the choreography and the actor's sort of motor within uh, the frame actually gives a, an illusion of, of uh, sort of cinematographic dynamism. And it's a really interesting phenomenon that because you kind of mistake it for camera movement, but it's actually sure. actors doing that. And the lensing of that is very carefully thought out with Joe and I. And but it's really interesting to play with those illusions, cinematographic illusions to create movement. But they're actually it's like a it's almost like a snowstorm, you know, those little things that you shake up and you just watch it. It's absolutely static, but it's it's kinetic and, and going crazy. We had it, was great a, fun. it was a quote from from Sydney Lumet, I think, um, uh, who said, "You know, don't move the camera, move the actors." Um, and uh, and this was a film made on a very, you know, quite a tight budget, um, with not many days to shoot it in. Um, and we didn't have, you know, because we were in lockdown, we couldn't bring cranes in and out, for instance, uh, as one normally would if you were shooting in the UK or whatever. So we. We were predominantly working with a camera on a dolly and sometimes a bit of track, but um, uh, so it really was about moving the performers. And I mean, I don't mean just like, you know, moving, the, tracking with them. I mean, like ha making sure that they're coming back and forward and through and that you have wipes constantly. Um, and the cameras pretty much uh, are either static or on a very short piece of track for minor adjustments. Um, and the choreography and the blocking that Seamus and I work on together 
uh, creates that creates that kinetic movement. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, when when you're working, you know, in in the preparation stages, when you're rehearsing with the actors or, or sitting around before you're shooting, you're dealing with with actors who have done this, um, you know, done this material on stage over a period of of months. Um, do you have to sort of subtly take this the stage out of out of their performances? Yeah, really. I mean, is the short answer to that. Um, every actor requires a different type of direction. Um, there's not one kind of method of directing that suits every single actor. And so you have to respond to each actor's needs and vulnerabilities and fears and and um, and abilities. Uh, and so, you know, Haley uh, is an extraordinarily emotional actor. Um, she uh, works from a very um, uh, imaginative, um, uh, uh, emotional, um, almost dreamlike place. Um, uh, Pete comes from a theatre background um, and so uh, works in a far more technical way um, with a huge well of, you know, experience and emotion to draw upon, um, life experience. Um, uh, with Pete, it was certainly about, it's always with every actor I find, you, you, you work out what, what they what habits they've developed to defend themselves uh, what their defenses are um, and then how to strip away those defenses um, to so that they allow themselves to be seen and um, and allow themselves to be vulnerable and allow themselves to be um, psychologically and emotionally naked uh, in front of an audience um, and 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 it's those often they don't know when they've done it, um, uh, but it's it's really so it's kind of stripping people back, if you like, um, stripping the the theatricality out of the performances, but also that applies to every actor, um, whether they've whether they've done it on stage or or not before. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's interesting because you think of Cyrano. I mean Cyrano is a character who. In a certain way, is all defenses. I mean, what he Absolutely. what he walks into every room with is, you know, a complete wall of defense to to cover the fact that he feels you know unworthy. Absolutely, and there's a very there's a very interesting and, and Pete and I talked about it a lot. There's a very interesting conflict within the character of the kind of mm, the presentational the the the, the, the kind of um, public face. Uh, and then the real private um, Cyrano, and, and when he allows those cracks uh, to reveal um, who he really is, and 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 at moments he allows Roxanne to see that, um, and then he closes up again, um, and that was great fun to 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 work with Pete and choosing those moments, choosing the. The, the 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 moments in which the real Cyrano comes forward and then the moments where he's entirely kind of um the showman if you like yeah I mean I think I think one of the really effective things about it is that you know no there's no prosthetic nose but also I mean there's not a lot of talk about his his size either I mean it's it's basically about anybody who feels, you know, who's been called a freak and, and believes it, or who, you know, who feels like, yeah. Put your hand up. <laughs> or who feels unworthy of love. I mean, and, that, and that's that's a very large group of people. I think that's everyone. And that's, I think, fundamentally what the what the story, you know, what Rostan's brilliant creation was about. And I um and so one one hoped. You know that's why I wanted to make the movie is because I identified with it. It felt personal, um, uh, and and it's you know it's, it's a fear of intimacy. You know this. I love the idea that intimacy is into me, you see, 
um, this fear of intimacy that that we all have um, that stops us being able to be loved and love, you know. Um, uh, 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 and so, certainly, removing the nose was was key to to that um, choice. And then, you know, I mean, in the in 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 Erica's stage production, um, his height was never referred to. Um, I felt that, you know, in the medium of cinema, which is all about filling every frame with, you know, every inch of every frame with with reality as such, it needed to be acknowledged at the top of the movie, um, as it is in the theatre, um, with a couple of lines, and then we move past it and get on with the story and, and, and kind of um, almost let that just simmer away in the background when we really want to deal with the inner uh, conflicts and emotions and 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 uh, insecurities that happen in all of us um whatever you know wherever we wherever we come from everyone's got something that they think is unlovable about them you know yeah. you're beautiful but you feel like you're stupid you're you know, you're 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 smart, but you feel like you're not beautiful. You you know, you're um, I don't know, whatever it is, um, uh, we all have them. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to talk about a couple scenes in particular, and and Seamus, I I need to ask you about the you know the balcony scene because you've got the two characters on the ground who we mostly see in silhouette and and in darkness, and then Roxanne is in her room and she's you know lit by this this gorgeous glow from from behind but it's also on her face as well i mean what was you know what was lighting that like well it, yeah it was fun and we discussed joe and i discussed the lighting of that obviously we had to preserve a certain amount of obscurity for for christian and for cyrano down there there had to be this kind of uh, sort of equivocal uh, point of view that who is that who's speaking so we wanted to preserve the, the 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 darkness down there but obviously Roxanne had to look glorious uh, so although she's backlit by candlelight apparently by candlelight we did have a a lovely soft balloon light uh given her a, a glow sort of uh, slightly unnatural glow but it, it, it was moonlight but then we ended up sort of making it a little bit warmer uh just for purely for cosmetic effect uh and and joe had sarah greenwood had painted this beautiful sort of titian sky behind her because we knew we'd, we'd be looking upwards towards her so all those color elements that joe's great at thinking about way in advance all coalesce to create this balm of of seduction um but we had we had fun with that the location offered us the perfect architectural construct uh, to allow for for uh hiding and for the the voiced echo around that courtyard and for it to be, to be uh you know you're not sure where the voices and who the voices belong to so I think that the, the, the palazzo we shot in allowed for that. And then we, we also used split diopters, photographically speaking, to be able to, so we didn't have to pull focus so that we could, between the various protagonists, they were, they were both sharp at the same time, whether we're looking at Christian or Cyrano or Roxanne or Cyrano. Uh, that way we're, we're not playing with uh, an audience's perspective it's just it's all there for the audience to see at the same time mm -hmm. right so was that a was that a location joe that that was just that existed in this in this italian town yeah i was really i, I was desperate to get back out into the world and back in uh back on location you know i'd, I'd made a, a few films and that were very studio based and and uh so Sarah Greenwood and I uh, went out to Notto. Uh, it was a town that she'd seen previously. Um, uh, she'd visited visited the town, um, I think, seven or eight years ago, specifically to try the cannoli, um, which are uh, okay. fantastic in Notto. Um, and um, and so we found that location um, 
quite soon within our within our scouts you know it was there and it was and it suddenly i try and make all my films quite sort of site specific um so that i'm not trying to force the script upon locations but really allow the locations to speak to me and then i'll often bring those into the screenplay and allow them to inform the screenplay and this idea you know traditionally and it seems like quite a simple thing but it really unlocked something for me that traditionally Cyrano and, and Christian are underneath her balcony um, so one would assume that there's a balcony that protrudes um, and they're underneath the balcony uh, which works in theatre but in film it means um, you're never going to be able to see them in the same frame. Or if you do, they're going to be very, very wide and you're not going to be able to read any emotion. Uh, when we first saw that location and it suddenly occurred to me that you could have her in the balcony there and then Pete um, in the foreground uh, in the same shot, um, suddenly it kind of, it made sense to me. And then that kind of moment as he's creeping up the stairs and round, um, uh, it felt, it felt like it was it was you know suddenly the whole scene unlocked and it it, it was very it was very exciting right um, i also want to ask about the 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 song wherever i fall which is sung by um you know a, a trio of of soldiers basically as they're about to go out to die and it's it's shot mostly inside sort of cramped quarters on the you know on the side of of mount etna but um the song it also Seamus, this camera pulls back at the end so that we see, um, you know, Christian and, and Cyrano. And now that was a sort of a defensive mechanism that you you put in there so that the song couldn't be cut. We'd chosen a site up Mount Etna at 16,000 feet um, near the summit of the volcano. Um, uh, and we we built a set. Uh, we brought in elements of volcanic rock. Um, pieces that we could then create this kind of um, uh, this network of, of trenches really rather like First World War trenches and we built a camera platform um, and that was we were bringing in a techno crane specifically for the, that sequence um, the whole back war sequence and we conceived it so that so that we could shoot everything off this techno crane because it was quite difficult to move up there um, and uh, and we were happy with our plan with our war plan as it were and uh, and then four days before we were due to start shooting um, uh, a massive uh, snowfall came and buried our set in uh, two two and a half meters of snow um, and, and in fact, the set was completely um, inaccessible. We couldn't even get there. Um, so we moved the, the, the site down to about 8,000 feet, um, but we understood that we needed some weather cover. And so further down the volcano, we found a, a quarry um, and Sarah moved some, uh, had some pieces of rock very hastily built and we built this kind of cave against the face of a quarry um so it was all kind of having it was all making it up as we went along you know which was kind of terrifying i like to plan things quite carefully um and now suddenly we were you know shooting the biggest sequence of the movie uh totally unprepared um with only a camera and a tripod um and a very very limited amount of days um in fact we lost a couple of days of shooting um uh, and uh, and we had to rethink the whole sequence um, and so uh, people were looking for cuts you know production uh, in the studio were looking for cuts um, to 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 mean we could get out of there on schedule um, and um, and they said well you know you could cut wherever I fall that's a song without any uh, lead characters in it it's completely unnecessary really to the plot um that's the one that you should cut and i was you know um uh horrified at this idea because it felt to me that the the song was really the heart and the backbone of the film um this love of life that i was trying to convey um and uh and so the only way that we could um think of maintaining that song um was by uh folding it into the final dialogue scene between Cyrano and Christian 
And if I'd shot it within the master of that scene, then there was no way they could, um, anyone could continue to suggest that I cut it. Um, so that's what we did. We shot a master that started all the way uh, from the beginning of that song and then played all the way back and then played the entire dialogue scene between Christian and, Christian and Cyrano, which was about a seven minute take, I think. Um, uh, and, um, and, 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 and I feel like that song informed the dialogue scene that followed it as well. You know, um, uh, there was not a dry eye on set and, and, and I felt that P and Kelvin really understood the weight of what they were talking about in the context of the song that, that um, Glenn and, and Sam and Scott had sung. Uh, so sometimes those things just kind of, you know, those kind of things work out and, um, and uh, serendipitous, but um, it's, not, it's not a situation I'd like to repeat. The volcano then erupted on the last day of shooting and we literally had to pick up our camera cases and run off the mountain with lava big spat at us. Although actually it actually wasn't the lava apparently that was the problem. It was these rocks that kind of project out of the volcano and can kind of shoot through you like a bullet. Um, but we got out and, uh, and, and, and no one was hurt. So that was okay. Yeah, probably, probably not a situation you've faced before, Seamus. No, it's uh, one of the most memorable experiences in my career thus far. Uh, I, and, I, I, I'm glad that I can experience it now in the cinema, the safety of a cinema, rather than <laughs> in the reality of, of getting spattered at by a, 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 an angry volcano. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you made it out, but I'm glad you got the the scene too, because it's a it's a really powerful scene in in a really beautiful movie. Um, you know, I could keep on talking about this, but I I think we need to wrap up so um you know thank thank you both um to the audience thank you for joining us um uh, you can we have a free trial to rap pro you can become the first to know about upcoming screenings and and get access to exclusive content uh, also if you want to see past screenings you might have missed go to the rap.com and click on the events tab in the navigation bar um so joe seamus thank you very much for for the film and the conversation Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Steve.